Hello, welcome to another video. Today I will be reviewing the Letters of Enchantment duology by Rebecca Ross with Divine Rivals and Ruthless Vows. I literally finished this yesterday <laughs> and um, I have a lot of thoughts so I thought um, I'd review it for YouTube and make lots of enemies. Let's get into this. Disclaimer, if you like this book, please do not watch this. Spoiler, I did not like the duology. So if you love this book, do not watch this. <laughs> you will not like this video. And I am so sorry in advance if you still decide to watch this video. I'll start with the positive. I like the setting of having two people exchanging letters during wartime. I love that. I don't mind the magic typewriters. I do mind when the magic is used as a plot device, which is what happens there. But <laughs> positives, let's think of the positives. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I didn't like the characters. I didn't like the writing style. I didn't like the minimal amount of letters. I generally thought it would be more letters than prose and it was mostly prose there's like a few letters here and there <laughs> scattered amongst all the prose and yeah i i was expecting a lot more from this especially because it's so hyped like people absolutely adore this book and i wanted to be one of those people and um of course i'm not because i don't like hyped books <laughs> just I don't know. This felt very very YA to me. It was middle of the road, funky magic system that just is there but not explored and it's just like you're just throwing everything at it trying to explain um, plot holes with magic. If you're going to use magic, you have to weave it into the story in a way that makes sense. And with this, it just didn't make sense. I saw Becca from Beginner Books, I'll link her channel down below, talking about this thing, saying like the magic was just added onto a story that was already written just to make it fantasy. I think Becca nailed it on the head. Like it's generally what I think also what happened is that Rebecca Ross wrote a historical romance and because she is typically a fantasy author they've asked her to make it fantasy so she weaved magic into it. You can tell that she's added the magical element afterwards like an, as an afterthought. I could be completely wrong, I do not know Rebecca Ross. I have no idea how, what is her thought process when she writes a book but this is how it felt to me. I did not like the characters like Iris and Rayman are, in my opinion, stereotypical YA characters. She is this little petite, because of course she's petite, this petite girl um, with um, so much intelligence and then she's very shy and she doesn't know how intelligent she is and how amazing she is. And then you have Rayman who is this... Um, meant to be broody type guy with dark hair, dark eyes, <laughs> like the tall, dark and handsome persona. But it just, to me, it felt really flat. And then the whole rivals to lover thing, where? Where is it? Where is the rivalry? They just, they, the only rivalry they have is at work because they are aiming for the same position. So like in book two, you kind of understand like his point of view a little bit more because you get it more explored and he was hired at the Gazette to become the new columnist and then and then the boss hired Iris afterwards and then he created the competition between them basically so it's not even like she knows that there's a competition like she didn't know <laughs> that he was there first and he was already told like you, you will get the position they literally added someone to make it more difficult for him to get to the position, which... What? And of course it's an insta-love for him, because why wouldn't it be? I feel like in a lot of books, it's always the dude falling first, 
which I am a cynic when it comes to love. I I do not like typical romances. I need angst to make it. it. I need them to have obstacles to go over and to go through together and like to grow as characters as well as their romance, which is why I love enemies to lovers and I love like who did this to you trope and those type of things like the one bet trope in a fantasy book when it's done well and it's not at the beginning, it's like towards the end. I love those because there is strife, there is. And with this it's just like, he's insta in love with her when he sees her because she's so pretty and so pretty and she's got freckles. When I read the line about freckles, so if you don't know and you probably don't, Adela Rue was my <laughs> worst book of 2023. I obviously didn't do a video on it because I literally started my, my booktube channel in 2024 but The Invisible Life of Isla Rue is one of the worst books I've ever read in my life and it was really badly written and I, yeah, I'll do another video on that one but Isla Rue has seven freckles on her face and they form a constellation of stars that line about Isla Rue having seven freckles on her face is used so many times like every time they say her name or someone looks at her, they mention her freckles. And every time Roman talks about Iris, he mentions her freckles. And I was just like, <laughs> why? <laughs> she has other features. <laughs> her, your attraction to her is not dependent on whether or not she has her freckles. I don't know. I just, I hated that. And I, it just reminded me of another book I hated, which doesn't help. But that was like in the second book, he kept talking about her freckles. And I was just like, mate, move on. Please move on. Talk about something else because right now I just want to throw this book at the window. Although I did not read it physically, I listened to the audiobook for both of them. So yeah, so the love story is my main issue with this because he's in love with her from the very beginning because of course he is. And she doesn't really like him. She acknowledges the fact that he's attractive, which, you know, most people do. When you see someone attractive, you say, oh, he's attractive but you don't necessarily have feelings for that person. And she doesn't have feelings for him at all. He's just a co-worker that likes to pester her at work because of course he does. That reminded me of another book I hated. I don't like books. Really? Do I? <laughs> um, yeah, the, oh, what's it called? The thing with the office romance and it was so bad and the girl has green eyes and he paints his bedroom in the same shade of her eyes and just like, what? But that's something he would do. You know, like the dude in that book. I'll try and find it. That he's he's the guy from that book that I absolutely hated. He's the same with her. Like he's pestering her because he likes her. Like like a fi like a five year old. Like a schoolboy. Dude. Also, they're like nineteen. As a thirty three year old woman, they're nineteen years old. <laughs> they are children. And it's very hard to get invested in their relationship when it's very, very childish, in my opinion. Again, I'm way past the demographic for this book. I, I, I am fully aware of the fact. So the romance in this, he gets the, the job as the columnist and then she goes to the front to become a correspondent. So he goes and follows her and then he explains to her why he followed her. The whole time they've been exchanging letters, she didn't know it was him because he used his middle name, which, you know, catfishing would make it fantasy. It's not even miscommunication, it's genuinely catfishing. He's catfishing the girl because she is conflicted with her feelings for Roman and her feelings for Carter when it's the same person. And I hate when people do that or when books do that or movies or TV shows. Just say it. Just say who you are. You're just creating this issue that is going to come up later on in your relationship. What are you doing? Why Why are you doing this? Anyway, so then she finds out he hits him and then she's like, she gets over it very quickly, which, okay. Again, they're 19, I understand that. The time frame for this book is very short. Within this couple of weeks, they literally fall madly in love or like, well, she falls madly in love with him and realizes that all oh, this time she's been in love with him as well. Like where, where was this underlined? <laughs> Have we read the same book? I don't know. Anyway, so they get together and then they get married because of course they do, again. Okay, when there's certain influences around you, like war, 
are like being stuck in the same house for a long for a few weeks or something like emotions and feelings grow a lot quicker and they get amplified because of the situation around you which obviously is what happens here and they get married and then um they get separated and then he dies but he doesn't she goes back with her brother to their hometown and saved by the the enemy god because yeah there's gods and if i mentioned that there's gods in there too the magic is just used to move the plot along but you only get the magic when the plot needs to be moved along otherwise you don't get any magic or or the only magic you see is with the typewriters and you don't what you get an explanation to, as to why the typewriters have magic, but how did they put the magic in the typewriter? I might have not been listening in when that was happening because I zoned out a few times listening to this audiobook. And then this one I've listened to all week on um, my commute to work. This one was hard to listen to. <laughs> I really struggled through this. It was it was absolute torture listening to their ramblings. And nothing happens for so long. At some point, um, Iris does say, I can't believe it's only been a week since we've been separated. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> are you serious right now? It's literally been a week since the end of the, of the first book. Okay. He's saved by Daycare, who's the Malvoyant god. He doesn't remember her at all. And then like, he gets glimpses of his past in dreams. And, um, and then like he starts writing for the opposition and then she's in their hometown in Eif and then she's trying to um, get back to Rome to Roman but she doesn't know how to get back to Roman blah 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 and then it just I guess it goes on from there and then there's just there's a lot more of Roman in this than there is Iris I'm not complaining I didn't like either other perspectives so it didn't make much of a difference to be quite honest but yeah in this one I don't know the letters were a bit different and then she did the catfishing <laughs> Because he starts to remember Iris and then she starts sending him letters um, with her middle name. And then I was like, oh, they reversed the catfishing. How cute. They can tell their grandchildren when they're old. And then there's so many like near miss with them. Like they nearly die so many times. Like it's not even funny. There's so many near misses. At the end, there's like a huge near miss, and I was like, oh my god, it's finally happening, one of them's gonna die. Thank the lord, they're gonna turn this into Ruby and Juliet, that's fine. <laughs> I would have taken this, I would have been so happy if that had happened. It didn't happen, because of course it didn't, it's YA. But um, yeah, I wish, I wish they died. At least one of them had died. Um, <laughs> both of them, I don't care, I'm not, I'm not picky. One or both, it's fine. I mentioned the dreams. So in the dreams, it all gets tied up like, very neatly their like their plot gets resolved very quickly what i didn't like in particular with this book is that all of a sudden she becomes this savior type person which you know i know they are the main characters i understand that <laughs> and i get that they would have to be the ones to resolve the problem with the gods but they have so many people around them that have particular skills that could do it instead so one of the people she interacts with a lot is um, a soldier. She's a, I think she's a general, I don't remember. She's one of the leaders in the army. And she is a warrior, like she's been trained as a soldier and she's in charge of a lot of things. And then the only way to kill the god is by beheading him with a special sword, which obviously she gets given the sword because why wouldn't the writer be given a sword to kill an almighty god makes perfect sense to me anyway she gets given the sword he finds out his dad is um a traitor which will big whoop anyway so his dad is in court with the bad guy and she's obviously trying to get back to roman and when she gets the sword <clears throat> her friend hattie is like a musician oh yeah music is banned from this but obviously that's how you get rid of the goddess by like playing this lullaby and they'll go to sleep and you can behead him basically but of course iris gets magic dreams and she gets to talk with the the main god enver who is like a good goddess or whatever i don't know the whole thing like i said like the magic is used to move the plot forward 
it, it's my opinion, my opinion and my opinion only, I do not believe that Rebecca Ross knew how to end this book with that added magic as well. So I think when she wrote Different Rivals, she had like an idea for this book and it would be like a standalone, like a dramatic love story type thing. And then she was told to weave in magic and then she's like, oh my God, I can make a duology out of this and put more magic. But this felt like a load of magic was just put onto the story just to make it move forward. There was no substance behind it. I feel like in when this war book, you expect like the body count to be quite high. Like oh, personally, I expect the body count to be quite high. And generally there's like two characters that die. One of the last scenes of the book that made me roll my eyes so bad, I thought I was gonna crush my car, was because, so they, so he was captured at, near the end because He's revealed that he was a mole the whole the whole time, blah blah blah. So he's put underground in the in with the within types creatures that like to um, eat and kill people, and then he wakes up in there just before they start like bombing the city. And when he comes out, they're like killing all of the soldiers that were on daycare side. Um, but like some of them obviously had their memories wiped when they were saved by daycare because he wants them to join his side so like he's wiping away their memories so they are easier to manipulate do like a fighting squad where they just like start lining up people and just killing everyone and then lo and behold <laughs> she's told this is going to go down and that Rayman is in amongst them by like some random dude that was like a, a mean man the whole time until the last minute and he just like switched. And then they, he's working so hard to save this guy, the son of the dude that was really mean and then like using him. And I'm just like, why are you trying to save him? He's just a dude. Like, don't get me wrong. I get he's the main character, but like ex apart from Iris, nobody else really cares if Roman is alive or not. Like obviously their friends will be sad, but all in all, he's no one. He's not important to the rest of the world. And she's not important to the rest of the world either. They're just journalists. But it's not like they are so important that like, I don't know, like the heir or or this mighty warrior or whatever. They're not, they're just journalists. And people go out of their way to save their lives. Besides the fact that they are the main characters, they do not have a role. <laughs> in the like extended universe of this book they don't have another purpose their only purpose is to write newspaper articles about the war there are hundreds of other people that could be doing the exact same job that they are doing <laughs> so i don't i did not understand why they have to save Roman so bad because once he's saved nothing happens to either of them like they're just there they're just too people on the sidelines political scene they're not involved in the the war laws entanglements they do, do not have anything to do with the system in place to that governs their world it's literally just two journalists and everybody's trying to save them so hard and they keep putting themselves in situations where they have to be rescued by other people and they can't do it by themselves, which really annoyed me because they are not warriors. They are not meant to be warriors. It's not like Final of Lost where Aelin is the queen of Terracin, so she has to survive because she's the queen of an entire kingdom. She needs to be there. She needs to be alive. Or if it's not her, Adian has to be alive to take over. You know what I mean? In Fourth Wing, Zayden has to be alive because he's the main focus of the children of the rebels. Like, he has to be alive because he's a symbol that everything can be righted in their universe. He's, you know, he's not just a plot device. He's an actual character that needs to survive in order for peace to be instilled in their world. They have none of that. They are just writers. They are just journalists. They do not need to survive the story for the world to be fine. 
they are nothing. They are just writers. I, it's just, mm, I don't understand why they had to survive. Why did she have, like, and then she just ran across the entire town to get to him. And then, so they're like, literally, he's on the firing squad. So he's like standing, standing up with like another, I don't know, 10 soldiers. And there's people with rifles in front of them now ready to get everybody. And she comes in running in front of him and everybody gets shot. And I was like, oh my God, finally, finally, she's going to die. And then the dude that was meant to shoot Raymond stops when he sees her. Why did you stop? Why? Why? Why did you stop? Why did you stop? She's just a girl. I don't understand. I don't understand how this makes sense. It just doesn't make sense to me. Please, if you've read this book and you've loved it, explain to me why they have to survive for the world to be okay, for their town to be okay, for the war to be resolved. They do not need to survive. Yes, she killed the, the god. Anybody else could have done it. I understand that she had to she has to do it because she's the main character of the story. It's not like they were made the rulers after this. They retire to their little cottage or little apartment or whatever, and they start being journalists again. Or like he's writing a manuscript, so I'm assuming he's writing a book now. But like, it just it it doesn't make any sense. Why did they have to survive this? Besides the fact that they are the main characters, what is their purpose in their world? Why they have to survive and why they are the main people that pe everybody else is trying to to like keep alive. Please explain this to me because I don't understand. Apart from the fact that they're the main characters, I don't understand why they have to survive. Please tell me what is their purpose. <laughs> Please. If you read this and you like this and you've watched my rant on that about how awful these are. Please let me know. This was my review of Letters of Enchantment. I shall not be reading anything else by Rebecca Ross ever again. This was my first book by Rebecca Ross. I've had a few of her books over the years. I've never actually picked them up. I wish I had not picked that up, but you know, I had to see what all the fuss was about. I still don't know what all the fuss was about. So um, yeah, please educate me in the comments if you have thoughts and if you really enjoy this. Um, I like to understand why you have, because why not? <laughs> but yeah, that's all for me today and I shall see you in my next video. Bye!